Here comes Johnny. <laughs> I'm so happy, Johnny Moezi, that you are in our program. Thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, when I saw you on the tape, uh, you know, I said another Persian is doing fantastic. It's going to take over Hollywood. Another Persian blues guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but, but we don't have that many Persians. <laughs> but uh, but uh, when you mentioned B.B. King, I, um, that really, uh, you met B. Uh, Mr. King. No, I, I went to see B.B. King play when I was in high school, wow. and uh, I have an uncle who told me he was steering me toward this kind of music, and I snuck into the show. Uh -huh. No tickets, and uh, every time people would come for their seats, I'd get up and move, and finally I was standing right in front of the stage, and it was like, uh, you know, being in church. It was, uh -huh. it was like a gospel sermon, just the way he was playing the guitar, and playing to his audience and just very soulful expression. It uh, captivated me. I have heard that he's very much interested to teach the younger people of what he knows and I have seen some of the work that he's doing. Well, I, I, the thing about this music, uh, jazz and blues, uh, is that it's always a case of the older generation passing it to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, I experienced that with many of the people that I played with. I would just beg to sit in, you know, play for a few minutes with the band. And any time at that stage when you're sitting in with the band, it's like, uh, okay, you can play now. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, so you learn that way, and uh, that's the way the tradition is passed on. And when I was in Europe last year, I realized how much it might be America's greatest gift to world culture is mm -hmm. jazz and blues. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's always a case of the elders teaching the younger ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah. This is like the folk songs usually, you know, usually in Iran too. Mm. Uh, not only the songs, the dances, it comes from, it come from one generation to another generation. Yeah. And the Persian classic song, you know, traditional song is the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, is music, uh, what is it that you just, uh, how old were you when you started uh, thinking that uh, this is the field I want to be into. Usually the kids, young kids, they want to be fireman or they want to be policemen. <laughs> yeah. I, I went through all of those. Uh, <laughs> my first memory of music, really the first, I remember being, because I was born in Iran, mm -hmm. in Tehran, and I remember my father, who has always been a great dancer, and I remember hearing him or watching him dance to the Bee Gees. He would uh -huh. be playing the Bee Gees. And I remember being two years old, three uh -huh. years old, and, and he would turn the music up. And, and I remember that. I also had a cousin visiting from California, and she was a teenager at the time, and she had her acoustic guitar leaning against the wall in my parents' apartment in Tehran. And I remember looking at the guitar and thinking it was the most fascinating, complicated-looking thing I'd ever seen. And it just it kind of captivated me. And uh, the first real experience live of hearing it was, was Andy, the Persian, Persian uh, singer uh -huh. at the Pars American Club in Tehran. My parents would take me when I was a kid and they tell me now that uh, as a child I would stand next to his leg kind of the whole time <laughs> they were playing I would stand next to, to Andy's leg <laughs> and we reunited after 20 something years when uh -huh. I moved to Los Angeles years ago mm -hmm. and uh, so I think it wasn't until college you know I went to uh, American University in Washington DC and uh, politics was really interesting to me at the time. I think it was like the 92 election here. And um, it only took me a short time in Washington to realize that uh, music was much more powerful than politics mm -hmm. in terms of touching people. So I was playing professionally at that time. And, um, you know, I was really going through, deeply going through all the, the music and uh, learning and playing live. And um, by the time I finished university, I knew that music was my path. So, mm. yeah. When you say Bee Gees, what happens, you know, sometimes I think when I go back to time prior to that, Beatles, mm. uh, they did this in 60s, the Beatles did, yeah. the Bee Gees later on, but they are still uh, have a lot of followers and I still enjoy their music. How could it how this how could this happen after 40 years after 50 years you still like that kind of music what is the difference between that music and some of the music we hear today that you hear now and you forget tomorrow 
uh, good writing, first of all, uh -huh. and uh, that same tradition that we were talking about, because the Beatles, when they started, they were mimicking, you know, a lot of American R&B and Motown, and, and then also taking Tin Pan Alley and pr proper, you know, I mean, the writing is what it is, and, and classical music. So good writing and, and that tradition we were speaking of, mm -hmm. I think those combine to make things timeless. They combine to make things, a lot of that is lost now. A lot of it is now kind of the electronic things that are happening now, which are fantastic, and new, but I think people have maybe lost sight a little bit of what the good writing is and, you know, singing without the help of electronic aids and so just those natural talents mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it helps having a, a point of view too, I think. That is true. Yeah. And uh, you still have family in Iran? I do. Uh -huh. Yeah. Many cousins I've never even met still. My uh -huh. grandfather there. Uh -huh. But if anybody sees you in the street, they know another Persian walking away. If you go to Westwood, everybody's <laughs> going to talk to you in Persian anyway. Yeah, that's so, true. Uh, w uh, this thing you did, uh, I admire you uh, because I have seen people want to do an album. But you are interested in something like that. And it is costly. Mm. Co at this time, it's very hard to get backing. Why? Because... Uh, there were times that people would buy albums, they buy CDs. I remember that studios here, they, the Persian companies, they spend hundred thousand dollars on an album. Yeah. But now nobody does that because of the internet, because of what is happening. And every you play a song today, tomorrow everybody has it. Uh, so in order to do something like this, uh, you have done this. You have asked people, who do you think? What type of people or who, uh, the, the type the in, interested in music, uh, would come and they would say, okay, we want to invest in Johnny Moezi and uh, do this? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of things that combine to make this kind of a, a, a good solution. Uh, I think people are so tired of being fed, you know, what the mainstream wants them to hear that anybody who really loves music at this point, or art of any kind, now has to make use of those tools to go search out what it is they actually care about. So if you get tired of what the radio is playing and what the TV is always showing you, uh, you and you're a lover of music or a lover of art, then you use these tools to go find the stuff that really moves you. And um, I think that... Uh, the people, I mean, it's funny because I think the grandparents, like my grandparents' generation, they don't understand probably why somebody is is going to their audience or going to their fans and asking for them to contribute to make an album. But it's freedom in many ways from the old system. The old system was that the record label would would pick and choose what you heard, when you heard it, who you heard, and uh, all according to their mechanism, which in some ways was good, in other ways... It was you're either you didn't have the freedom. you're in the club or you're not in the club, right. and so this way it's just uh, yeah it's freedom. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's a good way to find the people that care and let them have a part of it. Let them uh, make it happen with you, and um, so you know it's 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 honest I think. But uh, well, let us say, internet has done uh, last few years has done <laughs> very unusual things. Same way that you cannot sell an album, they can play it and uh, it hurts you, but at the same time, you find ways to get to people. Like I saw your work through internet. Yeah. So if they close one door, you have to climb up from window to come in. Well, it makes it, this makes it so that now the live performance, it's kind of, if you think of it the way it was in the old days, Ike Turner was going around working for five different record labels, selling albums out of the back of his car for f many different producers and sh playing shows all the time. If nobody's going to pay for music now, like they don't pay for albums, let those people who care enough make the album and then all of us, we kind of show it to the world, we give it to the world and you come to the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, the show is, the live show is something uh, that you either have or you don't have. Many people can sit there and put something together in a studio and then say, hey, look at this. But to have that and also have a show that moves people, the energy kind of gets inside of people, and that's, that's something you can't replicate with technology. You mm -hmm. can't, uh, a video doesn't do it justice. It's, 